Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, Rockville City Council explores allowing 16-year-olds the right to vote. State Senator Susan Lee, appointed by Governor Wes Moore to be Secretary of State, who will replace her in District 16. And happy days are here again in Annapolis. There's a trifecta. The Democrats are in charge. Will the last Republican to move to Florida turn out the lights? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by former County Council Member Mike Knapp, and president of the Chevy Chase Republican Federation of Women, Lori Halverson. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Rockville City Council is considering lowering the voting age from 18 to 16 to draw it in line with a national trend. Mike, what national trend? <laughs> and is this a good idea? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that I know of what the national trend is. I think we're always looking for ways to continue to increase um, civic engagement. Um, and as a former chair of the Montgomery College Board of Trustees and having, work, having been a county council member and seeing what the, the role that the, the board, the, the student board member plays, the SMOB plays there at the Board of Education. Um, I think that there is a tremendous um, insight that youth can bring. Um, I think that there is a way to continue to get people engaged. I think we've seen over the course of the past um, national and statewide elections that we've seen um, an increase in the youth movement, which I think is a great thing. Um, it, how sustainable that is remains to be seen. Um, Candidly, though, I think of the issues that are out there and I think of the challenges that we're con confronting as our communities continue to grow. I'm not sure that that necessarily leaps to the top of the list I would be looking to, to address, but I think that it's um, as one who continues to try and find ways to increase civic engagement, I think if that's a way that we can do it, that it's probably worth at least having the conversation. Well, I, you know, look, I'm, I'm a curmudgeon and I'm old. And, you know, I remember when I was a teenager and I was really stupid. Um, and I don't think that was, you know, uh, so unusual for teenagers to be really uh, not it, not understanding the, you know, the scope of the world and world problems. Well, and I just, I, 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 I just but I've, you yeah. know, we, I was part of the generation that went from 21 to 18 and in, in the right to vote. And it was all, you know, understandable. If you're going to fight for your country at 18, you sure. should be able to vote for your country. I, the, the reduction of the, of the, of the age to 16 just, it seems to mystify me. It seems like it's just, you know, one more. If, if, if however, I'd go back. If intelligence were a criteria for voting, I'm not sure how many people would actually be able to vote today. So <laughs> well, there are people who watch this show that think I'm pretty stupid still. So, so not, so not well, necessarily you, but I, but I think, but I think, um, yes, I think that I think we need to make sure that lots of people are better educated on the issues that they're confronting in the polling place. And we should be doing that much more broadly across our country. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Lori, there is another nuance to the proposal that's being bandied about in, in Rockville. And that is, you know, that it would also allow non-U.S. citizens the right to vote. Why is that a good idea? You know, this is not about getting more people to vote. Um, under 17 percent of voters voted in the Rockville election. Bridget Newton, the mayor, got... Um, she got 7,600 votes. So what this is really about is trying to make sure that no Republican can win an election. But if you expand it to vote, if you expand voting to under 18 and to undocumented immigrants, you are, those are people are more manipulable. <laughs> is that the word? Manipulable? Well, well, <laughs> you can, you, you can change their minds easy. Um, and, and they're, and you can have control over them while they're in the schools. You can also, um, you know, get their interest as they're new coming into this, since they're getting all this money from um, the liberal side, uh, as they come to the United States, it's, it's, you know, they're going to be voting for Democrats. You're going to get more Democratic votes. So well, you know, but I really mean, about, the Rockville elections are nonpartisan, aren't they? I mean, I, yeah. that was my, my that's record. what they say. But I can <laughs> well, tell I guess, you, yeah, Tina sure Mulligan ran as a, she's a Republican, but she ran as a nonpartisan. But everybody knew everybody that the, all the Democrats made sure they knew she was a Republican and don't vote for her. And they formed a coalition, uh, a, a slate 
to, to prevent yeah. her from getting more votes. Well, I, I, I guess I'm intrigued that the notion of increasing the amount of voters necessarily going to Democrats as opposed to Republicans. It would seem to me if we can get more people to vote and we can provide them with the right tools, they're going to be better informed and, they, and they're going to make, make better decisions on behalf of our communities and our states and our, and our country. I, I don't know how yeah. more people um, necessarily ends up on one party or the other. Well, I think well, the, I agree the, we need the to question, the question really, let's, let's, let's parse this out. The question is, should non-citizens, non-U.S. citizens have the right to vote? I mean, that's, it's not just get, generating new, new voters. Right. It's, it's, I mean, it's, I, it's, I think whether you need the to right the right to citizenship vote. should be granted to non-U.S. citizens. Yeah, no, I mean, non-citizen, I mean, I would never expect to, to go over to another country and be able to immediately vote without being a citizen. That is just crazy. I would not expect anyone to give me that, that privilege. It's a privilege to vote. We don't just give people out, you know, you just can't just vote because you happen to be living here. I mean, that's just- let's, let's, I mean, We only have a minute left. Mike, let's take, you well, take a crack at that. Sure, no, I mean, I think I think in community elections where, where you have residents who are who have lived in the community and they may be here legally to work, they may be here on, on green card status and they are residents of a community. I think that that's something worth, worth entertaining. Um, I think it, at a federal level, I think it becomes an interesting question. I think at a state level, that becomes a question. But I think in a community election where you are legally, you're, you're here, you're a resident of, of the community, and to be able to vote on the things that are affecting the community in which you live, I think that's something that's worthy of consideration. Well, uh, you're going to have the last word on that because we have to go <laughs> wrap, wrap up this topic and go to another. There were a couple other ideas that are being bandied about, including the expansion of the Rockville uh, City Council from five members, a mayor and four council members, and a mayor and six council members. We don't have time to discuss it right now, and whether to align what is generally an at-large race to separate districts, whether that, you know, you know, in a small jurisdiction like Rockville, whether that is beneficial or not. But let's go on to the bigger fish, and the bigger fish is up in Annapolis, you know, where representation by Montgomery County political leaders have increased significantly in the administration of Governor Wes Moore. Uh, last week, Delegate Eric Ludke was named Chief Legislative Officer. And now this week, Senator Susan Lee has been nominated to be Secretary of State. And we further uh, expanding Montgomery County's, I guess, clout. Delegate Mark Corman has been tapped to serve as Majority Leader. Mike, the Montgomery County delegation has grown and obviously political clout is gonna be able to take advantage of this this newfound uh, position? I, I am certainly hopeful. Um, one of the things we've not been able to do particularly well relative to the other jurisdictions in the state is to establish a set of priorities that we as a community need to kind of put forward and to kind of march in line to make sure we achieve those priorities. We tend to be very, our, our delegation tends to be very diffuse on the issues that they're focused on. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed, especially as folks move up to higher positions is they tend to take a broader view. And so they wanna make sure that we're taking all positions into account, which is great. But I've noticed that we tend not to have, we, we tend to lessen then the, the Montgomery County vote um, perspective in that, in that discussion. And so I think it's gonna be really important for us and especially our local elected officials, the county executive, the county council to really push on those folks who are in key positions within the new administration and those folks who have been elevated within the legislature to really identify a clear set of priorities and hold together to achieve that set of priorities. Baltimore City, Prince George's County do a great job. We do not do the same way. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting conclusion. So, Lori, the vacancy created by the appointment of Senator Lee uh, as Secretary of State creates once again the issue of how legislative vacancies are filled in Montgomery County and in the state of Maryland. Adam Pugnucode, author of the online website, uh, Montgomery Perspective, criticized the Montgomery County Central Committee or the Democratic Central Committee for, for tabling a resolution that would have allowed a special election to be filled by for legislative vacancies and concluded his, this, his piece with this quote, what's not understandable is how people who don't favor elections can call themselves Democrats. Well, that's being called out by one of your own. What do you think? Yeah, I think that uh, there is a, um, it, what, what Adam Pugnico was saying, it is a longstanding practice of appointing themselves to office. 
And, um, you know, we need to, I think, have a better democratic process. Um, I think uh, Linda Foley was appointed to the District 15 uh, race, and then she won her uh, first uh, time she had to run for office. She did win, so it gives them that edge after they're appointed uh, to win their election. Um, I do think it, it makes sense to have, um, you know, have the people have some input. Now, I, I do think there is sometimes a problem with the timing because um, when someone is appointed like that, like today, when Wes Moore is appointing new people, um, there's not time to develop a process to elect somebody. Um, and do you leave those positions vacant? And that is that really fair for the party that that happened to? Um, so there should be probably some temporary um, placements in, in that case. But um, I, gotta, I gotta tell you, I'm in District 16. And, you know, what and this affects me. I mean, I voted in every the last election. I didn't vote right. for Senator Lee. But, you know, the fact is, I should be allowed to vote for who's going to be my state senator, whether I'm going to lose or not, I should have the right to vote for who, the person in uh, the General Assembly that's representing my district. I think it's I think it's wrong for the central committees to have these powers. Both, it does both give them a lot of power. Whether the Maryland or, I mean, the, the Republican or Democrat. I think, the, right. I think it should be by special election. I've been surprised to see how quickly they can move elections forward in the, in the Commonwealth of Virginia this past year. They've done three now in the last six weeks. And, and they've been very fast and I, you know, but, but they've been elections and people have won and, and have gone on to represent the legislature. And I think that there's something there that we should be looking at. Yeah, well, I, Mike, I agree. I agree with that. You know, so <laughs> the, the old adage, and again, I love, I love to bring up old adages where there is a will, there is a way. That's, yes. <laughs> when we come back from this short break, Governor Wes Moore and Aruna, and Aruna Miller won election in a landslide does that mean happy days are here again in Annapolis? Stay tuned. Welcome back. After eight somewhat contentious years dealing with a national health pandemic and a spendthrift General Assembly dominated by the opposition party, Republican Governor Larry Hogan delivered his final address this week. After highlighting accomplishments such as implementing tax cuts that have helped the middle class, increasing spending on education, reducing the state's deficit, uh, budget deficit, and leading the state safely through the COVID pandemic, Mr. Hogan warned against engaging in toxic politics that are dividing <laughs> many Americans. Lori, as a rule of thumb, during a Maryland governor's first year in office, not much is accomplished. But given the progressive nature of the General Assembly and its avowed legislative proposals to you know, finish what they started last year, uh, including a constitutional amendment to change the current abortion law, the, uh, which would allow late-term abortions, legalizing the approved ballot initiative on recreational use of marijuana, and even passing more gun control restrictions. Are we going to see an active General Assembly this year? I think we'll see a lot more action than we did if we had a Republican governor take office. Um, but I'm not sure because yesterday uh, I went, I was, I was in Annapolis with uh, over 20 ladies from the Republican Party, and we were um, going around the offices and giving them our priority list. And um, they were all moving in boxes everywhere. The newly elected <clears throat> delegates uh, didn't even have a computer set up yet. So they're still just getting, uh, getting set up yet right now. Uh, but I think they'll get going. And I think, you know, with, there's a lot of new appointments and new leaders with new responsibilities. I have to say, when we stopped at Mark Corman's office, he was very, very um, organized. Um, I didn't see any boxes in their room. So they got the award for the most organized um, of all the people we visited. Mark was um, always very well organized. Yeah, very. it was, it was very, very impressed with their office. Uh, and, um, you know, but I think that the priorities are going to be where the money is. So I think, you know, the cannabis is, is huge now that we've voted to pass it. So I think we're going to see some action there because they really must make some changes or, you know, make some uh, legislation in order to get things moving. Uh, uh, and I think, I doubt that we'll see much business expansion uh, with the appointment of Susan Lee uh, as the Secretary of State. I, I don't quite understand that appointment. Um, uh, so I, I don't see much expansion in business, but I do think that we'll see uh, the cannabis uh, industry that will be, we'll see some changes, uh, some improvements. Uh, to that. Um, uh, so, you know, and I doubt we'll see that, that much in education, even though that's a. Lori, you just, we kind of lost, we're kind of losing you there, Lori. So I'm going to uh, go on to go on to Mike. Um, 
Mike, among the agendas proffered by candidate Moore when running for governor was to leave no one behind, help Baltimore. Oh my gosh, we always have to help Baltimore <laughs> and uh, save the environment. Now, these are wonderful ideas and you know, wonderful uh, aspirations, but what can actually be accomplished? during this shortened legislative season? Sure. I mean, I think one of the things I've been very impressed with so far with the Moore Miller campaign is their efforts on in transition. And I think they're very mindful of the fact that they recognize that you, you there's campaigning and there's governing. And what they've been working very hard over the last um, seven weeks to be able to do is to identify a, a blueprint for what are those steps to take those ideas and actually make them governable and actionable. And I think I, I was reading in a couple of pieces the other day where the reporters have been alluding to the fact that the governor has not necessarily outlined his, his key priorities yet. There've been some, some insinuations and clearly the legislatures have started to take their priorities out there. But I think that the, the governor elect is really looking to make sure that he has clear actionable steps in each of those areas so that there is, there is progress that can be made. And so I think you will see progress um, in things like Lori was talking about with cannabis, that's got to get done. And hopefully we'll address that in a way that doesn't dilute that as a market. We're seeing many, many states right now where they thought this was great. And you had cannabis organizations that were popping up all over the place, businesses all over the place that are now actually closing because there's, there's not as much demand as there once was. So hopefully we can figure out how to do that in a way that's both equitable and, and makes market sense. Um, but I think looking at things as it relates to workforce development and really beginning to make expansions there, looking at environmental, taking environmental steps. Um, I think we can build upon where we've been in opening, opening the, the state for business. Um, I think that we can continue to focus on that. We're an attractive place to do business. And I think people will be excited, especially once they kind of hear the, hear the governor's mission. But I think what he's been very mindful of is Let's lay out that plan. And I think in the coming weeks, we're going to hear those actionable steps, not just government, not just campaigning platitudes. So, Lori, are you are you back online? Let's just check to see your check your sound. Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. OK, so, you know, for, for years, you know, it's not surprising. We you know that many of, of Governor Hogan's vetoes were overridden by uh, the, the General Assembly. And of course, you know, uh, having you know the trifecta of the the governor's the governor's mansion as well as both houses, uh, who's going to act as a counterbalance to rein in some of the more, uh, I guess, progressive ideas? You know, when it comes to taxation and and it comes to uh, pushing uh, social issues, uh, can can the Republican minority really mount any kind of um, speed bump in the in the road to these these. Well, yeah, we, what we really have to hope for is that citizens will come forward and testify and really make um, a, a really let our voices be heard. If they hear from a lot of Republicans who are opposed to many of these um, initiatives, I think that we will um, see some action. Um, but we need to. Uh, not scatter ourselves around. We need, you know, we need to figure out what are the priorities and focus on those, or we'll get nothing done. So, um, and and there are issues I think that we can work together on. Uh, I think we all care about education. We all want to see children uh, reading and writing at grade level. Yet the blueprint for education does not even uh, have that requirement. So that um, you know, we we can work together and find common ground. Mike, any final thoughts before we? Uh... No, I, I would just. Um augment what, what Lori was talking about as it relates to education. Um, I heard a presentation from former county executive Ike Leggett this past week on, and he, who's leading the efforts in the blueprint. And I think focusing on getting, you know, really making sure that we are highly competitive in the educational space is a key priority, both of that Blue Ribbon panel and of the, and of the governor. And I think it's exciting to see what we can do in education in this state. Thanks. Thanks both of you. So our last topic is, kind of, you know, this isn't really a throwaway topic. Um, uh, but but it, it gathered a lot of headlines this past this past week. And as before we go to break, there was a major story in the news national news cycle about the Consumer Product Safety Commission proposing to ban gas stoves, which was mightily denounced by the restaurant industry and the 40 percent of Americans that currently cook using either natural gas or propane. <clears throat> and while the proposal was quickly walked back by the Biden administration, unsaid was the continued war being waged at the local and state level. And Lori, if, if memory serves me correctly, in the newly passed Thrive Montgomery 
2020 plan, it phased out natural gas in all buildings by 2035. So uh, why, this, why this fight against natural gas, which is a relatively clean fossil fuel? It's just one more thing they can really uh, force us to, uh, to change. I mean, you can educate and incentivize me, but don't tell me how to make my personal choices. And that's what they're doing. Uh, and our county always goes the extra mile, even if the federal is not doing this, they're going to continue with it. Uh, you know, Americans love their gas stoves. Uh, they're not yet hearing about this. So when they start hearing about it, they're gonna be really upset. Um, you know, I personally did my homework when I got my kitchen renovated and I have a induction stove. I love it. Um, you know, I think it is the way to go, but we, you know, I think that what we need to do is educate people. I never heard of an induction stove until I uh, had an interior decorator who told me about it. You know, it, it, it wasn't out there. Um, it, it's a great way to, to cook, but you don't tell Americans how to cook. Uh, that's 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 really going. <laughs> yeah. That's going into your kitchen. You, yeah, you know, let the, guy, let guy Fietti tell you how to cook. My, my, you know what? You know <clears throat> what, what's going to happen here? I mean, it just se it just seems as Lori suggested that the, the county the county is intruding on our own personal decisions on so many of these things. So it's interesting, and, and I will candidly admit this is, this is not an issue I was paying much attention to until we started to talk about this over the last couple of weeks. And interestingly, even just this morning, was watching a segment on the news program that talked about both the challenges from a, from a natural gas perspective, but also, interestingly, the health issues associated with it that we're just starting to be actually begin to see. And, and I don't pretend to have spent much more time than I did this morning listening to the news broadcast, so I don't, want to, I don't know that those are fully formed, if they're not fully formed, but I think it's an interesting discussion aligning both, both, both the health and the environmental element that I look forward to learning more of, learning more about in the coming weeks. <laughs> yeah, well, whenever there's pushback, claim, claim there's a health benefit. That's, that's really uh, always- uh, There you go. There you go. We gotta, we gotta save that. Anyway, uh, we gotta stay tuned for parting shots when we come back from this very short break. And welcome back. Now with party shots, Mike Knapp. Thank you, sir. Um, I just want to build on the conversation we had earlier. I want to wish our new governor elect and lieutenant governor elect, uh, Wes Moore and Aruna Miller, best of luck as they get sworn in this week. Our new controller, um, I wish her the best of luck, Brooke Learman, and our new legislators um, throughout the state, no matter which party they're in. It's, not, it's The beginning of a session is a new opportunity for us to establish a vision for the state and, and a way to work together going forward to govern. And I just want to extend my best wishes to eat to all of them as they start to learn the way, start to work together and identify those issues and come up with strategies that will hopefully benefit all of us. Great, great uh, ideas. And I hope, I hope you're <laughs> absolutely correct. Lori Halverson, your party shot. Yes, I just want to encourage people to keep up with the legislative activities. Keep watching 21 this week and uh, read, yeah. you know, your local newspapers and things because um, we can testify. You, anyone can testify. Uh, and, and the House of Delegates is now um, this year, they're going to have a hybrid where some testimonies will be in person, some will be online. So you don't even have to leave your home and testify sometimes. Uh, but you have to learn how to do it. Uh, and you can get help from uh, the Montgomery County GOP or even the, Dem you know, the Democrats can help you too, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and testimonies are much more heard compared to emails because it goes on public record. So please testify. Well, you got all choked up there, Lori. Uh, <laughs> I know, it gets me so. <laughs> I, I you said Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wanna thank you both for uh, tuning in today or participating today. I wanna thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show. And just remember, today is Friday the 13th. It's Colgate Day. Go Gate, fight team fight. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>